Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. And this episode is uh, another one that we pulled on. And overwhelmingly, you all want to learn about how to influence supply chain, which I think is really important. The one thing that we've noticed about supply chain over the last 10 years is that usually this was kind of looked at as, as a cost saving center, but more and more because of consolida- consolidation with hospitals. Um, and of course, the complexity of the healthcare market, a uh, supply chain in hospitals is actually being looked at as a revenue generating center. And so they have more influence within the hospital purchasing cycle, which is why I would imagine that many of you on All Hill Medical Sales chose this as a topic. So not a lot of people we can go to for this, except I was fortunate enough to find one person. Um, Justin Poulin. Uh, Justin is the uh, founder and CEO of a few really interesting companies. One is Beyond Clean, which focuses on SPD. The other one's on uh, called First Case, um, which focuses on uh, which is an operating room podcast. But then for this episode, I want to talk about his uh, podcast called Power Supply. Uh, Power Supply is essentially uh, a podcast about hospital supply chain, believe it or not. You can learn more about them and, you know, have a lot of great resources for industry on powersupplymedia.net. And so this episode is going to focus a lot on how do you influence supply chain? How do you partner with them? And more importantly, how do you drive deals specifically with supply chain as a partner? Now, before we jump to that episode, we got to plug a couple of really great resources for you guys. Uh, The first one is Alpha Sophia. Let's face it, finding and engaging the right physicians these days is really difficult. And uh, most importantly, though, is that finding the right physicians and adopters is what's going to actually accelerate your product adoption. It's all about finding those early adopters, whether you're a startup or a large, more established company launching a new product. So how do you do that? Well, I think data and data sets are probably the most powerful way to do this because finding out uh, which physicians have specific uh, prescribing patterns, uh, surgical volume, uh, what societies do they attend, where, where are they on social media, that really helps. Well, Alpha Sophia is one of the companies that I've decided to partner with for this. And the reason why is that, number one, they have a product that is the most affordable on the market. Uh, their packages start literally at $300 a month, which make it, makes it great for startups. But more importantly, I was really impressed with their platform because they focus on how do you target and discover early adopters. So this is great for startup founders, also great for sales teams. And now uh, the one thing I suggested to them is to have a special offer for my audience. And this is the offer. If you go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar and their uh, company's name is spelled A-L-P-H-A-S-O-P-H-I-A.com forward slash Omar, um, you'll get uh, three physician profiles for free. So essentially you go to them, you know, and they're going to open up their platform so you can see how it works. And you're going to descri- tell them your territory and pr- potentially three physicians that you want to get information on. And they're going to pull those profiles for you for free. So go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar. Take them up on that great offer and get those profiles for free. And if you think it's great, take it to your sales leadership and get a demo with them and get this great tool for your entire team. And finally, if you're a medical sales leader or maybe a med rep looking to level up your game, let's face it, it's more difficult than ever to sell today, to get attention, to grow your career. I put together the Medical Sales Network Effects program to teach people how I use social media and digital channels such as email, video sales letters, and more to target reach and influence the key decision makers of a hospital, whether it's a hospital CEO, uh, head of nursing, surgeon, uh, 
anybody and, and above, right? And so I put together a very in-depth course on this, but along with that course, you get this amazing private network of VPs, CEOs, recruiters, and reps, plus a live weekly coaching call where you can jump on, ask me anything. It's a great way to get closer to me and to be part of this. I kind of, kind of call it a mastermind of the top marketing and sales professionals in our industry, not to mention CEOs and founders. So for that, if you're listening to this podcast, I have a special offer just for you. Normally that program costs about $3,500. That's that's essentially how high I got it to last year. I decided to discount it to make it a little bit more affordable for everybody else and to make it easier for you to join. So for only $19.97, you can join the program, be part of that private network and get those coaching calls. Just check the link below and click it go and join the program. And I'm looking forward to helping you. We've had a lot of great uh, success stories. Here's one uh, from a rep from Spinal Elements who actually got these results that you're about to hear within about three or four weeks of the program. I tried to reach out to this one surgeon. I posted recently on LinkedIn about launching a bunch of new products in this year in 2023. He accepted my connection request liked that comment and two days later booked a case with this new technology that we had showed him two days later or two days prior. So it was like all like a methodical step. So in the surgery yesterday went pretty well. He agreed to try it again. Um, so I think from our standpoint, it was a, it was a win, win, win of getting the connection on LinkedIn to seeing our content, having a good inner office meeting from a standpoint of being able to talk with the surgeon about the new technology and what his peer was doing and then having a successful case where he would want to use the product again. So, and we have so many testimonials like that. Another great example, Vendela Martin, who sells to gynecologists, recently has been just on fire. The last couple of weeks has been posting fantastic content um, to the point that uh, a OBGYN publication published a post and tagged, I think, nine or 10 physicians plus her because they literally saw her as a peer. Now, the best part about this program is that you don't need to post actively and consistently all the time on LinkedIn to get some results. There's a variety of ways for you to do it. Heck, believe it or not, even the mad device rep is in the program. So with that being said, check out the program, click the link below and unlock that special price and join. Now, with that being said, let's get on to my episode with Justin Poulin. Enjoy. What's going on, Red Hat gang, and welcome back to another episode of the State of MedTech. Big shout out to the followers and the great community over on Instagram with All Hail Medical Sales. So, you know, uh, as we all know, uh, hospital sales and med medical sales has gotten a lot more complicated to the point that even some of the uh, really heavyweight, well-known sales leaders who come on my show say, man, I'm happy I'm not a rep these days because it is so tough. And so, you know, two areas that we talk about a lot is supply chain and SPD. And we did a poll and I think a, a little or close to a 15 or 1600 of you guys voted um, between influencing supply chain and influencing SPD. And everybody, I think 74% voted for supply chain. And so for that, I invited my good friend, uh, Justin Poulin, who's a uh, expert when it comes to supply chain. There's a few other things he does, but Justin, you know, maybe before we get started, uh, for those who don't know you, I mean, uh, tell us, tell us a little about yourself and your company. Yeah. Uh, I am a registered nurse by trade. So that's how I got my start in healthcare back in 2010. Um, I left the frontline clinician positions and uh, moved into a medical sales job. From there, uh, became a big educator in the region, got involved in lots of professional trade organizations and at the same time, had a pastime going back to 2004, where I was podcasting and was the first credentialed media member from new media to access the Boston Celtics locker room. So about six years ago, seven years ago, uh, all things converged. And I combined my podcasting with my education, with my entrepreneurial medical sales experience, and uh, formed a company with my business partner, Hank Balch, called Beyond Clean. Um, it was founded like many of our now several other brands uh, on podcasting, educating, having really industry leading conversations with leaders um, from across sterile processing. And then about three years ago, we began an initiative because many of our partners were coming to us saying, We've got this great niche in sterile processing, but what about supply chain? Does anybody listen from supply chain? Or what about the operating room? A lot of the decision makers are are there? Are they listening to the podcast? So we launched uh, two additional brands at that time. First case for the operating room, 
supply chain, uh, I mean, power supply for supply chain. And uh, meanwhile, I'll just go back a little bit and say my interest in supply chain was really because when I left nursing, I had no idea the business of healthcare. And so I got involved with my local ARM chapter. I was the education chair for the ARM chapter for over five years, learned a lot. And, and that's really where I started to understand, okay, the business of healthcare, this is what they're looking for. I can bring clinical excellence you know, to frontline clinicians, but how do I then translate that when I'm going through an RFP process or really engaging all of the stakeholders that are gonna be making the decision to move forward with our, with our company? And so, um, the companies themselves have now grown. Uh, we do sales trainings for manufacturers. Uh, we do a lot of social media consulting and strategy, and we create lots of great educational content um, to really resonate with those that are working on the front lines. And I'll say the pandemic really set us on quite a trajectory once all the in-person events stopped. Um, it brought a lot of attention to all of our brands, and, and we've really been succeeding. Uh, every single year at such a greater pace and awareness of our brands. And I'll be honest with you, it's a ton of fun to take three things that have been a big part of my life and merge them really into, into one business. That's awesome. And just, just for context, before we kind of jump, jump into it, um, what's the best place people can learn about like the show and everything? Do you guys have a website or a few of them? What, where, where can they go check out and learn more? Yeah. So since we're going to be talking about supply chain, I'll start there. Just go to powersupplymedia.com. But I'm sure many of you out there, obviously, if you're contacting supply chain, you're likely selling to other departments. So if you're interested in the operating room, go to firstcasemedia.com. And then for Beyond Clean, which is our sterile processing brand, uh, go to beyondclean.net, soon to be beyondcleanmedia.com as we kind of align all these brands. But for today, beyondclean.net. Fantastic. All right. So like, let's get into the topic that is one of the more important topics in medical sales, but you know, just really isn't covered, which is supply chain. Maybe you know, a good place to start, even for some of the more senior reps, I think it's good. Um, what is supply chain? <laughs> supply chain is so many things, as you know. Um, right. Yeah, you know, that's why I, that's why I want to start there. <laughs> it's really broad, and I'll and I'll tell you, you know, like with Beyond Clean and First Case, it's a pretty targeted audience. I would say in supply chain, we can be talking about a number of different issues in the industry that might not even relate to some of our audience. You have materials management, you have contracting and procurement, you have logistics. Um, and, and it is even broader than that. So uh, there is a lot involved when you say supply chain. It's really how do the goods get from the manufacturer or the supplier? Um, and also there's purchase services. So it's not always a product, right? Sometimes it's a service that you're delivering. How does that get to the hospital, then get to the departments that they support? And are we meeting contractual obligations, looking at utilization? There's a whole analytics now. Value analysis, which is uh, has really emerged to to really be almost its own. I, I could almost take value analysis out of supply chain, but it's very much a function of a clinically integrated supply chain as well. So um, I'm sure I'm doing somebody a disservice as I try to define that as broad as it really is. Yeah, no, and I no, I think that's a, that was a good that was a good definition of it. Um, and you know, I think maybe a good good approach first is. You know, one thing that I've noticed uh, is some of the obvious areas, uh, like one thing I talk about with my audience is pipeline velocity, meaning, you know, how do you take a deal and shorten it? Like if your annual, your average pipeline velocity for a deal from start to finish is like six months, how do you, how do you turn it into three months, right? And I think one of those things is getting ahead on uh, the relationship with supply chain. I think a lot of reps, they focus so much because it's important on developing the relationship with a clinical champion, in most cases, like it's a surgeon, working with other clinicians like the nursing team, PAs, the scrub techs, et cetera, maybe dealing with admin. And supply chain is like like near the bottom, if not like close to it, like right there with, I would say, like procurement, for example, you know? Um, and, and I think that that's one of the most important relationships to get started with, because what I realized is that when you go through supply chain, even when you're dealing with a... Um, a trial of a product, right? Or evaluation, that relationship, if you don't manage it early on, it could be something that holds your deal up for like a month, you know, because they got a lot of things going on. So or longer. If, or longer. Yeah. Depending on the, like, especially these huge hospital systems. So let's, let's, I'm going to like role play here. Let's pretend I'm a, I'm a medical sales rep and I have, you know, some, some device, 
right? Let's say let's say it's it's a unique enough device that it's not like a Me Too product, but it's not like a, I don't know, it's not an MRI or a robot. Okay, uh, where where do you start with supply chain? Like who who's the person that they should start developing the relationship w with first, and why? I mean, honestly, if you can start establishing a relationship with the VP of supply chain, that's the key. Um, they may not be the one that's ultimately going to execute, but those relationships bring a lot of credibility, especially if you've built a relationship. I mean, many of the people who are listening haven't sold just the product they're selling today. They've sold a number of different products. They've probably worked for other companies. They might be a 1099 for a distributor rep, supply chain. Them having an experience with you and you delivering good quality service, sales, a good experience, being responsive, I can just tell you time is of the essence. The time demands on supply chain are outrageous with all the back orders that they have to manage now. Entry level positions coming into materials management are requiring more and that those demands are falling on leaders for training. So I bring that back all to say, that if they think that you're going to bring something in and it's going to take them or their team a lot of their time, you're going to you're definitely going to end up getting a lot of pushback because they time is is at a premium for people working in supply chain. So you want to have a relationship with the VP of supply chain so they already know what it's like to do business with you. If you have that, you have an edge. That's a great point. And, you know, just just for context, again, like I'm I'm a big believer that in 2023 you use uh multiple channels to establish communication so that you know there's in person of course which by the way a lot of people think i'm anti in person i'm very pro in person like if i you know when i ever have a chance to go to a conference meet my customers whether it's ceos or even sales reps in person i do it but then along with that aside from email there's social media and i just did a check um again i always prefer people to make their decisions based on data and not my opinion but right now i searched on sales navigator from linkedin and I put in just supply chain and just for the United States and only for hospitals and healthcare. I didn't include medical practice, just hospitals and healthcare. And so on LinkedIn, there are 80,000 supply chain professionals from VPs to directors to managers. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing that I'm pretty shocked by. Of the 80,000, 8,000 of them, which is about 26%, okay, uh, had posted original content on LinkedIn in the last 30 days. That's an insane number. And, and, and it's new. The, Why? The online Why community for supply chain has been starving for content. Honestly, I think it's the networking Do you think it's because piece. they're all regulated to their, to their departments and it's a very lonely life. And now like there's a community, there's like, you know, ways to get better and, 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 and progress and everything. I, I think it's a ton like what it was like in sterile processing before Hank Balch and ultimately we formed Beyond Clean. And There's I remember, no by the voice. way, when you guys yeah. started it many years ago, I loved it because I was like, man, this is such a niche area. And there's a lot of people where, you know, they take a lot of pride in that area. Like, you know, a lot of times people, 100%. they go and they develop a lot of like domain expertise. They don't want to move. And I was like, every, this is one thing I kind of learned about social media. Every random group of people, no matter how niche it is, they have their own societies. They have their own ways of learning things. Mm -hmm. They have their own thought leaders, you know? And I feel like when you, when you do a good job of unifying those people, like it really exploits that. And I feel like you guys just did such a phenomenal job with that and beyond clean. Sterile processing needed it so bad. I mean, there's, there's been wage disparity in sterile processing, but there also is in supply chain and just getting that voice. And the other thing I'll tell you is I do think that supply chain found a network um, regionally, especially with like arm chapters and many people go to national events as well. But two things have happened. One, since 2010, when I got started, the amount of mergers and acquisitions in the healthcare space has been huge. So a lot of the attendance Oh, to yeah. regional events was related to networking, finding an open opportunity to move up. And now with this conglomeration, you're not necessarily, there's still lots of reasons to participate regionally, but it is a shift in mentality, plus a lot of younger blood that are comfortable with social media that are coming in. So those two things are somewhat converging, but it used to be you'd, you'd be involved in those events, especially when you started job seeking because there were lots of other directors that were looking for talent or VPs that were looking for their next director. And there was a lot to that. There's still a ton educationally and ways to grow professionally. Mm -hmm. And there's still benefits in networking outside of the organization. But those regional chapters just have less organizations, not necessarily less people, but less organizations. 
The other thing that happened was the pandemic, obviously, nobody in supply chain was going to in-person events. And those national events, the budgets aren't coming in. I talked to a ton of people um, at a recent um, annual conference, and they said, I paid my way. I used my vacation time. Hospitals aren't paying for them to go to these events. And I'll use this to preface, this is a great way for a rep to stand out and provide additional value as well, because you're right. Without the online community, they're getting isolated in many cases. Um, we have an advisory group with, with Power Supply, the number of the top leaders in supply chain across the country. Um, many of them are younger leaders. You know, they're the, they are the expert in their organization. They do not have somebody else. And um, so they have to look outside um, to make those connections and learn from each other. But again, back to the time demands, how can they do that? The easiest way is social media. They can get on their phones maybe a little bit at night, reach out to somebody who maybe is talking to original content creators, reach out to somebody who's talking about what they're talking about, um, and then they can learn kind of on their own time and when, when they have it available and still perform in their day-to-day -day roles. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because like the one thing I tell um, people is, I mean it doesn't always have to be product focused. Like, you know, many, many years ago, like in 2015, when I was really leaning into LinkedIn and the idea of like being a thought leader on there and everything, you know, I didn't feel comfortable. I was like, you know, I'm writing a lot about at the time, marketing and robotics, but I was like, you know, that's like middle bottom funnel. Um, you know, mainly the people were interested. I'm like, how do I grow my audience? And this is where I had the idea where, you know, I love reading books. I'm going to do a book review show. So every week on Wednesday, uh, wisdom Wednesday, I released a video summarizing book and you know i got a lot more creative around it like my editing uh, uh skills went up and i did that for three years late straight and the reason why i mentioned that is what i realized is that a lot of really senior decision makers whether it's ceos or vps at med tech companies who i wanted to work at or ceos of hospitals um surgeons and everything would follow my content and they didn't consume all of it but i just needed them to watch one video where they learned something Specific, that's of interest to them, whether it's, I don't know, biohacking, psychology, sales, leadership, all these different things. Like you never know what interest people might have. And now like you, you occupy a place in their brain. I think that's like one of the big keys. Um, you know, I just pulled up, um, I won't say their name. It's but not, let me say this. Oh, it's not yeah. the place for a sales pitch. I love what you just said. And I really yeah. want to back that up. It's not. And, and I see a lot of companies just pushing out marketing material from their social media channels. And I'm, and I'm just thinking to myself, I don't think you really understand the potential that exists in this space if you're just pushing out marketing materials because you are 100% correct. People want to mm -hmm. learn or they want to be engaged in a thought-provoking discussion. So you don't necessarily, a lot of people get scared to be involved in social media because they're afraid that they're going to put them out their opinions out there or somebody's going to learn something about them that gives their you know uh, competitor an advantage on them or they're concerned that they might say something wrong and that their company is going to give them a wrist slap do those things happen absolutely they do but the best way to manage that is also to just start good conversations post something that you noticed about the industry and say why is it like this you know help me understand or i'm i'm a rep in this space I've been working on this and I always bump into this and I don't understand why and let the community answer the question for you. And you'll, not everyone's going to hit, but if you get people talking and commenting in your posts and having a debate, it's going to be immensely valuable to you as a learner and also immensely valuable to all the people that you're pulling in that you're connected with. Like, wow, every time Omar posts this, I really think, and it gets my juices going. That's what people have always gotten from networking at events, a break from the job, a discussion that gets them thinking about how to innovate. Everybody wants to improve their situation if they're a real influencer. So give them an opportunity to do it. Set the table for them. A hundred percent. And like, again, part of this is just awareness. So like, I want to get into some details about if you book that meeting with like the VP of supply chain, like, what do you cover? What do you do? But I pulled up uh, a few profiles. So here I have, so for one, chief supply chain officer at Seattle Children's, it's a big place. Okay. The content he's posted or, and or reshared 
all have to do with um, personal development, like 10 things not to say in a speech, um, you know, the value of working hard, why you should reward employees and everything. And when he's reposting these, he's getting like a few likes. Nobody's commenting or asking him a question about it, his thoughts. And I think it's so easy to create a piece of content like that, you know, or just reshare it and then send it to him and say, hey, you know, I think you'd really enjoy this. And if that person reshares this to their network, all these supply chain uh, leaders end up seeing your name, your face, your company. Um, the supply chain manager- Or comment Bonsu on his post. Yeah, exactly. Comment Commenting on his post. Like, very easy he, way for get he doesn't, about He's not doing that to just waste his time. He's doing that because, and you know, he learned something. Yeah. Exactly. 100%. If you want to stand here's, out here's from another the crowd, one. encourage them to keep doing it. Director of supply chain. Immediately. Like, I've seen, like, three or four posts which has the American flag, uh, Ronald Reagan. So the guy's, like, Black Rifle Coffee. So he, yeah, so he posted, he's like, I found Black Rifle Coffee inside the medical center. This is awesome. So like the guy's like a patriot, right? Okay, like you you yep. understand something, you know? And, and again, like system VP supply chain about over his values. Yeah, about the value, their that's values. exactly correct. And I think that the thing that people forget, yes, we live in a world where um uh you know, pricing is important in healthcare, positioning, all these things. At the end of the day though, people enjoy doing business with people that they like and they'll find ways to justify it. You know, and, and again it'll I never tell, change. It yeah, will I, always be relationships. This I is tell, not going to change. Exactly. And I tell reps all the time, I'm like, look, not everybody has like a robotic system or something that's like radically different. Most devices in terms of how much better they are than the other, like the, the differences are kind of negligible, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell reps, I'm like, look, when you go to a conference, there's these little podunk, tiny little uh, device companies, like, you know, and they've been around for 10, 20, 30 years. How do these guys survive? Well, they have relationships with surgeons and the surgeons enjoy doing business with them. And they've, they've you know, made it so that th their hospital continues a contract with them. So I think there's, there's ways to really differentiate yourself. So let's talk about the VP of supply chain. You're a rep. Let's say you connect with them on LinkedIn. You've engaged with some of their content. And let's just say the VP doesn't post a lot of content. When you reach out to try and get a meeting, what, what do you say? How Like, what's the reason for them to take a meeting with you? Yeah, I think the number one thing you need to understand is they now have a seat at the table with a CFO. Um, and they're also in a position now with healthcare, cost savings, and uniquely new revenue generation. Supply chain has not been recognized for any revenue gen generating opportunities in the past. Now, you may, as a device rep, know inherently that revenue is the same as cost savings, right? Um, and that it hits the bottom line the same. But I can tell you that an obstacle that may have occurred in the past for anybody who is talking about, we can increase the revenue generation, you know, from the payers or whatever, you know, especially in like the operating room, if you're able to bring an efficiency or something to the table that increases revenue and profitability, supply chain is all of a sudden not just looking for line item savings. And you don't necessarily just have to go through a big value analysis process to get a meeting to have a conversation. You may go into an RFP. That could still happen. It really depends on your product, how impactful and broad it is, um, how simple the conversion might be. Maybe it's a service. That's a lot easier to bring in without doing an RFP. Um, you know, obviously the context really matters here. But at the end of the day, I would start talking to the VP of supply chain about and recognize that there are areas of opportunity that have now been presented to them because they have a seat at the table at the C level because the CFO cares what they do now. And I will also say that the CFOs don't necessarily have a really great grip or understanding on supply chain because traditionally they didn't focus on it as much. But if you look at supply chain expense, it's the number two expense behind human resources, staffing. And so it's been huge, but it's always been savings. It's always been savings. And you can think how many times have you gone in? And you can't really document the savings. It's soft or it's intuitive. That might work where you have a great relationship, but the minute they bring it up chain, it becomes very hard to convey. So if you have a way to talk to the VP of supply chain about, you know, listen, I know you're inundated with back orders. I know you're looking at having more supply chain resiliency. I know you're looking at, you know, sourcing products that are US-based manufactured. 
right? Just so we don't have to worry about shipping containers and issues like that. Um, if you can show resiliency, if you can show an impact on the bottom line through other creative ways, you are going to get their attention 100%. But I would say, don't come in like I'm different than the other guys or some vanilla, like understand the strategic, you know, um, goals that they may have and, and actually ask them, you know, like, look, I went on your website. I see that your company's mission and values are this, 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 and this, you know, what are your strategic objectives that support that? Because our company does these three things. And I think we might be able to play a part in your strategy. That's That's how I would approach it. That's a great And who does that? Who there, goes on the website and looks very, at mission, vision, values for very a healthcare few, yeah. organization and speaks to it? Yeah, very few people. And, you know, people sometimes roll their eyes at it and you can. But like, let me tell you, you know what? You know who brings, up, brings that stuff up all the time? CEO of the company, CEO of the hospital. Boom. And I think, you know, what I like about what you said is, you know, I think a lot of times the mistakes salespeople make is not thinking about, OK, in terms of the influencers of a deal what is important to them and how do you help them get what they want? And so in this case, like that's a, that's a gem you just shared, which is aside from cost savings, now supply chains being looked at for uh, growing revenue. And so I think, you know, walking in saying, Hey, you know, aside from explaining more about a business, you know, I've looked at your mission and values and everything. I also want to explain like how our product is not only just going to save, you know, bring cost savings, but show you, right how we can increase revenue. And for those who have existing accounts, the first thing you should do is go set up that relationship. I think with the, with maybe not the VP of supply chain, maybe their manager or director say, Hey, can I get Mm -hmm. the data for last year before we implemented this product and the data this year? And sometimes, you know, you're going to have to sit down on your butt and do the work, not send it to marketing and everything, but literally do it for yourself and, you know, put it on a slide and go talk to a new account and say, Hey, look, I want to show you you know, this hospital, maybe mass name and say, this is what their revenue was like and savings before us this is after us. And here's how I can help it for you. You know, here's the reason you do it yourself. Number one, once you're in a meeting, you're the one that's going to have to answer the questions. So if that, you don't have and, an intimate and, and understanding, and I it, you're dead. Yeah. And I'll add to that, you know, reps, just, just so you know, marketing is inundated with like so much stuff, so many things. Like uh, there's just so many things. And so that's good. You're going to be waiting a long time. And personally, personally, and they're not analytic skills. They're taking a tool, but they don't necessarily understand the data. They're not connected to it either. And they're not living it every day. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think that as a rep, the more you become the the way, you know, when I worked in Missouri robotics, they put pressure on us. And I was like 26 years old, 27 years old. When I did this, I thought it was normal. They're like, when you walk in the hospital, Everyone in the hospital, from the CEO to the staff, they should not look at you as like another rep. They should be like, oh, that, that is our account executive for our robotics program. So I had to spend time like thinking, you know, I, that's how I learned about marketing, patient events, uh, revenue, like all these things, right? So that, again, if you're a rep, the best thing that's going to happen is, okay, you do this thing with, with a VP supply chain and you get to a point where you're having to present to the CFO. Do you want to get to that point and not be prepared or you have to go tail between your legs to your VP says and be like, yeah. Oh, you know, we have a, we have a meeting with the CFO and I just don't know how I'm going to, you know, which, which by the way, it's okay to ask for help, but to start putting your posi- yourself in the position where you have the knowledge and your company's like, yeah, let's give this person more resources, but they know what they're doing. I think is the right way to do it. You know, I think reps and too many if- times they just want to rely on sales skills and it's like the surgeon will get it through. And then they're like, why, Oh, why is this taking so long? The, there's the other side too, where there's almost like, it, it's almost overconfidence where you walk into the meeting and, and, and I, listen, I get it. You know, your product's great. You've sold it and you've accomplished great things at other hospitals and you can't wait to tell that story. And you know that you're going to kill it if they give you an opportunity. But if you walk in without really battle testing the information and having an idea of what maybe some of the objections are going to be when you walk in, you're going to be in trouble. And they don't always come from the CFO, right? Like you might know the high level conversation for them, but if all of a sudden you've got stakeholders in that meeting, they invite a VP or two and they, and then they start peppering you with questions that you don't know the answers to it. You might've told a really great story to the CFO, but you get blindsided with a few things and it does all come down to preparation. And I guess you know, once you've been in your position for a while, you probably had all the questions, right? You, you've managed every objection six weeks till Sunday, but you still don't necessarily understand 
how it relates to what they're trying to do. So sometimes you hear this, and I, I've seen it all the time. You go in and you have the meeting, and, and I had a company that I recently um, you know, helped launch a startup. For the first three years, I went around presenting, and everybody was like, we love it. It's you know, what you're talking about is what we need. I, I would be in a meeting. It would have human resources. It'd have construction contractors. It'd have supply chain. We're talking about every single department and everybody would be like, yes, we want to do that. But then the owning group or the owning department was supply chain. And they looked at me and said, this is such a no brainer, except it doesn't help me achieve my goals. So it can't go on our initiatives this year because it's not going to hit our primary objectives. So call me back in a year. And that would happen over and over and over until we realigned our value prop. So if you're going to prepare for a meeting like that, and you already have some relationships, even if they are at a manager or director level, and you know you're going to the C-level, ask them, this is what I'm thinking about putting in front of the CFO. Based on your understanding of the culture here and what the objectives are, is this going to land? Are there things that I should be aware of that I should speak to that will just help us get better aligned. Because at the end, we all want the same thing. We want a successful initiative. And if you're not aligned with you know, what their goals are, or you don't see that coming, you might not get an objection that is like a standard, oh, you know, you're not proven, or where's the white papers, or where's the, you know, the data. You might get a completely different objection or not even understand why you're spinning your wheels. That's a good, that's, a, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. And, and something I have a, another thing I want to ask you about, but, you know, real quick, one thing that I, I recommend, and again, I feel like this is not just supply chain, this is anything, is a lot of time if you're a rep. And the one thing I'm going to, I'm going to pick on reps about is that our industry, again, I love this industry. There's a reason why I came back, but our reps have really, really big overinflated ego and a, and a sense, a sense of entitlement that I don't know where it comes from. And so whether you are 20, 30 years into your career as a rep or you're just starting out, one of the most powerful things I think you can do when you're dealing with supply chain or anything, but let's use supply chain, is that maybe before you have that meeting with the VP, you reach out to somebody who probably doesn't get anybody asking them anything, which is maybe uh, a supply chain manager, maybe the director and say, hey, you know, I'm actually interested in meeting with the VP, but I'd like to have a call with you. I just want to learn more about the department, more about what's important. And a lot of times, at least in my experience, those people are very happy. They'll get on a call and they'll give you the cheat sheet. Like, yeah, you know, when you talk to them, these are the things that are really important. And I would ask them, I said, hey, look, I'm just trying to do my job. I really appreciate your help. But like, what what are examples of why a product has not, has been shot down? And they'll, they'll literally tell them like, yeah, you know what? Like it, in this case, it was this thing was missing. In another case, it was that thing. You know, don't do this, do this, right? So now you have a cheat sheet. And then a lot of times what I, this is my like trick where it's kind of like a soft ask where I would tell the supply chain manager, and we're talking, I don't want to reveal the hospitals, let's just say huge, like top 10 health systems, I would say, hey, thank you so much. Um, by the way, I, you, please, you, you don't have to do anything else. So just by saying that they're alleviated. And I said, I just want to make yep. sure your VP's email, is it this? Because I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just shoot them an email. And if it's okay, do you mind if I just mentioned you and I spoke? A lot of times that supply Man, chain asking manager- asking for permission, instead yeah. of going over their head like that, Exactly. You can kill yourself. And if you can't get that VP's attention, you're now dead in the water because and, they think you went over their head. And you know, a lot of times if you if you do a good job, most people, right? Well just make they're the always intro. thinking about how do I make my boss happy? A lot like at least I've done that trick like five or six times. I know I remember definitely two times uh the supply chain manager and one was a manager, one was a director said Oh, by the way, look, let me let me just make an email intro because that'll be a lot easier. So that way your email doesn't go into their spam inbox. Yeah. You know, I, I shave you off know like the other thing that happens with, from that. with that overinflated ego is that myopia. So a lot of times <laughs> when we have this uh, overconfidence about we actually misperceive why a customer that's already an existing customer chose us. We think it's because, oh, this is the sales training I got. These were the value points that I was supposed to hit on. You have so much blind faith in the process and the product, which isn't a bad thing. It means you're in a great position. Just don't take it for granted because you might not have ever even really understood the value. And here's the other thing. It might have changed. The customer might have chose you even for all those reasons. But now, after the fact, with the benefit of hindsight and experience, 
they might see value in your relationship in a different area. You should go back to your existing customers before you go and approach, you know, a new opportunity and say, tell me what I'm doing right. What do we do well? How does it, how, now that you've done it, how is this impacting your organization in a way? And now you're killing two birds with one stone because you're reinforcing an existing relationship so stuff doesn't sneak in the back door on you. And you're preparing yourself to speak very honestly and um, genuinely about the value that you're delivering, not from your perspective, but from another customer's perspective. Oh, I, I love that you mentioned that. And again, like it kind of reinforces this concept that the very best salespeople are curious. And sometimes salespeople misunderstand that quote to meaning that like they're very curious when they're dealing with a, with a prospect, like asking questions. The other side of it is like really analyzing objectively what, what, did, what did I do really well? What's worked really well? What didn't, you know, and, and constantly challenging your mental models, because a lot of times, like you're, you're, you're often wrong about the reasons why something did and didn't happen. Uh, you know, just to kind of go back to one of the points we were talking about, about, you know, like reps with egos, what are some, like, if you had to put like your top two or three most common mistakes that you see a rep makes when it comes to dealing with supply chain, let's, let's put, let's say that having an ego and, and be, you know, making assumptions is like one of those things. But if you had to add two or three more, what would they be? Yeah. Uh, trying to convince the customer that it's really easy to make the change. Um, you do not want to, nobody in supply chain is believing it. They're not. It might even be true, but nobody is going to believe it. So you definitely don't want to be like, this is easy. This is easy. What you need to say is, hey, this is not as hard as you think, or you may think. And here's all the support we're going to provide. Here's what we're going to do. And, and I've got three customers you can call to fact check that we actually follow through on this so that this is not a painful transition. We understand you can only afford to change so many things every single year. And if you're going to select us, we need to make sure that you have a great experience during that conversion or that transition. And it really helps to have that plan lined out. Um, you might want to have different iterations of it, like a high level one and then a really granular one if they start engaging stakeholders as you gain momentum. Um, but at the end of the day, don't try to tell them it's easy or it's not going to take any of their time because, as I mentioned, everything is taking too much of their time right now. And That's so you point. just need to tell them this is what we're going to do because it is not a line item, plug and play, switch. You know, you. They're sick. They're in the. They're the middlemen between the vendors and the departments that you support. They get it from both sides all the time, um, and that's a tough position to be in. So don't don't uh, don't try to act like you're going to abandon them afterwards because it's so easy. Because they're definitely afraid of that because they need to move on to the next initiative if they're going to hit their revenue or savings targets that the organization has has set for the year. Do you, do you feel this is kind of, I, I don't know what, what you're going to say to this, but if it's a completely new account, like let's say you don't even have a clinical champion, but you're starting, is there any reason why you might start immediately with supply chain? And do you think like, does supply chain have enough? Again, this is a big assumption. Does supply chain have enough insight as to, oh, this is an interesting product and everything. By the way, like of these 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 clinicians, you should probably talk to these two because like they, they might actually like it. Like, is, do you feel like supply chain has that kind of insight on the clinical side? Yeah, I do. Um, it really? definitely depends. Yeah, but it, you got to find the right level for that. Um, the VPs may actually not be that engaged with the department leaders. Like, again, it's going to depend on your product, right? What, what departments are you selling to? What level are you selling at? You know, if you're selling at the C level, it probably doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense to start with supply chain simply to uh, figure out, you know, when we implement, what are we going to do here, right? What you really want to do is say, you know, take me or introduce me to the C-level. This is going to have really great impact on you, but ultimately this is kind of a C-level decision. Um, if you're talking about selling to a department, maybe like sterile processing, um, you know, or maybe even like the lab, I don't think it's a bad idea to start in supply chain because of what you said, but I probably wouldn't go to the VP. 
I would probably go to a manager or a director who is more likely fielding the day to day calls from those departments whenever there's an issue and a hiccup and is going to have a little bit more intimate understanding. So I don't think there's a problem in starting with supply chain at the beginning. They definitely appreciate when you follow their process. Um, and I know in the old days, it was like, go get a clinical champion, avoid supply chain at all costs, and then make sure that that influencer can basically, you know, throw their weight around to make it happen. It, even it just if doesn't supply happen chain these doesn't, days. Not happening no it, more. You know, and yeah, so and it I, makes a ton of sense to soften that ahead of time. I know. And you know what? I'm glad you mentioned that because, again, especially when you deal with um, – like some of the hospitals I dealt with in the past, uh, UCSF, Hopkins, and everything, even though I was dealing with like a really influential person, I mean, they even told me, and this is where I kind of realized earlier in my career where it's like, no, you need, I needed to start learning how to deal with supply chain where they're like, you know, you got to talk to supply chain. Cause like most of these physicians, they're employees. They're not going, you know, they can't go and hammer, put their fist. Down. And let's just say you're in a rural area where there's a physician who has privileges as at multiple hospitals and they could influence based on you still shouldn't rely on that. Like you really, you know, you just never know when things are going to change. And now like these relationships that you neglected, right. Maybe even spoiled over the years. Now they're They'll in a position of leverage you. over you and they don't forget, you know, they don't. And there's a, to that point about supply chain now having a seat at the table at the C level, it's really important to understand that they're also gaining a lot more influence. It was happening before. Um, there was a big move towards standardization and cost savings from, from standardization efforts. The back orders in the pandemic have definitely caused, you know, a little bit of a divergence from that path uh, to some degree. And when you talk about resiliency, that's kind of coming into that conversation quite a bit. But, but before that, they were gaining influence. Before, you know, supply chain was a household name, you know, thanks to toilet paper. Um, that was like definitely an area that they were gaining because that clinical variance, they were starting to take data and put it in front of the surgeons, to your point, and say, listen, you, you two surgeons both do the same procedure. This one uses this. This one uses this. And the one who's using this one. It has a 65% profit margin or something, and this one only has 25. Can the two of you please explain to us the reason for the discrepancy? Now, it might not have been product related. It might not have. Been. It might have been technique related. But at the end of the day, I think surgeons were beginning to get that kind of information. And I think once they had transparency, you know, into how that was impacting it, and now, you know, negative operating margins year over year, you know, a pretty bleak outlook over the next 10 years, at least till 2030 financially uh, for healthcare organizations, that's the surgeon's livelihood. They can't just pull weight and don't get what they want and shift to another healthcare organization. They're going to run into the same problem. Changing employers or having privileges at multiple facilities and shifting caseload volumes is no longer a strategy to escape the unfortunate reality that if they are not fiscally minded in their role, that they're ultimately undoing their own ability to get technological advancements. If they don't spend their money wisely, they don't get the new product. And they're starting to understand that because of the situation that we've been put in. This is, this is a great point. So Justin, I know you got to go and I like we kind of kept it nice and short, but very, very deep and high level. Um, last thing is like, uh, aside from, you know, and I'm going to encourage the reps to go check out both your podcast, Beyond Clean for SPD, but also power supply. And by the way, for the reps, just, just so you guys know, um, again, I'm very close friends with him, but the mad device rep at one point even got some certifications, both in supply chain and in SPD, just so you can understand them. So like really go out of what your way to do. But, idea. but aside from that, any resources like for supply chain, do they have like a, a national society? Is there a blog you recommend going to again, power supply, definitely there. Any other, you know, areas or like, are there any supply chain influencers on LinkedIn that are worth following? That that talk a lot about the topic. Yeah, there there's a number of uh influencers on sub, on supply chain on LinkedIn that you should definitely follow. Um, you know, I like following Hayes Waldrop. He's one of my co-hosts on Power Supply. He does a lot of great content. Um there are uh, Brian Bartell is another one. Um there's a number of folks that 
are involved with YPAC, which is the Young Professionals Advisory Council, which is through ARM. Um, so a number of individuals there like Ryan Burke, Rachel Anderson. Um, I don't know that they're, you know, posting a ton on social media, but they're very involved in cultivating, you know, that um, that community. Uh, there's so many. I, I, you know, I would just say look for hashtag healthcare supply chain and just see who's posting in there. Um, that'll get you there. As far as societies, ARM, which is uh, A uh, H R M M, uh, they're kind of like the national professional organization. They've got a certification called the CMRP. Um, you can get that certification as a vendor, as you just mentioned. Uh, AVAP is another one. Um, that's value analysis professionals, but again, very much a function of supply chain will help you understand the emerging and evolving and expanding value analysis process. So AHVAP, uh, they also have a, uh, a certification. If you're talking about, um, you know, sterile processing, then definitely look to HSPA or CBSPD, although HSPA has got a lot more um, content and they have a vendor certification. Beyond Clean has a micro-credential and a uh, little teaser. We've got some uh, vendor micro credentials in the works too. So nice. uh, that'll be coming along as well. Yeah. Look for that in 2024, if not sooner. And, uh, but, but honestly, like you would be shocked to see how many uh, people are writing about supply chain, but many of them are actually former professionals that are now consulting. So there's a number of consulting companies out there in the healthcare supply chain space as well um, that put out great content. So um, I would just say get involved and help us really drive uh, that community and the conversation because supply chain is something that nobody understood previously. Um, most people treated it like sterile processing. They're in the basement. They're kind of unknown. And now they're strategic sourcing. They're analytics. Uh, they're at the sea level. So um, give them the voice that they deserve now that there's some recognition for the efforts that they've been putting in as the foundation of the hospital. Nobody touches every department the way that supply chain does. That's fantastic. Well, Justin, look, uh, definitely we'll have to have you back soon. And again, we appreciate you spending some time with us. So everybody, that's been another episode of the State of MedTech. If you want to hear more episodes like this, again, follow us on Instagram, All Hail Medical Sales. The main reason is that that's the one place that I post a lot on the stories. We do polls there. I personally, people ask me because a lot of messages got summoned in. Uh, I personally am answering all those questions. Uh, and so submit your questions there. Give me ideas. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try and source the right people for that. So with that being said, as always, I'm going to remind you guys, if you haven't rated the show, please hit that subscribe button because there's a lot of episodes that I do not promote. You just have to get notified through the subscription. Again, subscribing is for free. So whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple, hit that subscribe button. Give us five stars. We're the number one show in MedTech for a reason. So give us five stars on Spotify, five stars on Apple, and don't forget to write a very short review on Apple. And I'll thank you very much for that. So with that being said, we will see you all next time. Bye for now. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of The State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care. See you next time.